A uh, very good evening to all of you. Thanks to Team Khaki for giving me this opportunity to revisit my doctoral research on Rangoli art. Uh, Rangoli is based a very broad topic uh, to discuss in such a short time, but I'll try to present an overview of my research and findings. Uh, Rangoli, the term Rangoli is derived from the Sanskrit term Rangavali, which in turn is derived from Sanskrit words Ranga, which is color, and Avali, which is row. And it is an ancient Indian folk art created on the floor. It is one of the important tangib intangible cultural heritages and a living tradition of our country. Now we know the tangible cultures are the painting, uh, sculpture, architecture. Whereas the intangible culture comprises of rituals, customs, etiquettes, performing arts, and all these can be recorded, but cannot be touched. And it cannot be experienced and interacted with without a vehicle or medium for the culture. So in case of Rangoli, this medium is the women of our country who not only practice this art, but pass it on to the next generation. Uh, Rangoli is known by different names all over India. Uh, there's a long list, actually, I've just listed a few uh, most popular names. But Rangoli, the term Rangoli is used as a synonym for any kind of traditional Indian floor art. Now, when I decided to do research on this topic, the first thing that hit me was that Though the art is very much visible in the public domain, you know, of streets in our country, it remained highly invisible in terms of research. Yeah, I realized that the distinction between high art and low art validated only certain topics of visual production as worthy of uh, scholarly attention. So low, minor, decorative or popular art was placed at the bottom of an assumed standard of hierarchy. Uh, especially with respect to Rangoli, you know, this connotation of this art being the art of housewives has uh, somehow got attached to it. And so it has either been, uh, you know, ignored or taken for granted. So I also faced this issue when, when I was looking for a guide uh, for my doctoral research. A few people with whom I spoke to uh, or whom I approach, we're not sure if, you know, a doctoral research can be done on this topic. But uh, fortunately for me, my uh, research guide, Dr. Varsha Shirgaokar, uh, I came in contact with her, I approached her, and she immediately accepted me as a PhD student. And thus my research journey began. Now it was necessary to have a formal framework of research for this very unconventional topic. So uh, where does this topic of Rangoli fit in the realm of historical research? The answer is the Annals School of Historiography. Uh, this school emerged in France in the early 1900s and uh, the analyst actually aimed at writing total history with the focus on non-political aspects of historical inquiry, interdisciplinary writing. So they borrowed from disciplines like sociology, economics, geography, law, uh, and so on. Motivated research of their undocumented or folk arts, or folk matters, uh, disregarded uh, gradation of cultures as high and low, very important and culture as a necessary component in the writing of total history. Now, uh, uh, these are the founders of the Annals School and they actually started uh, this journal, journal, Annals of Economic and Social History in 1929. The second generation analyst was, uh, one of the analyst was Fernand Brodel. And it was Brodel who brought the trend of writing on popular culture. Now his writings dealt with the neglected issues of daily life of human beings, such as manners, etiquettes, fashion, costumes, house decoration, and so on. It, it is really interesting to note that around the time when the analysts were attempting to introduce culture 
as a necessary component in the writing of total history. In the Indian, Indian scenario, the concept of cultural history was clearly being advocated by P.K. Gode in his writings on Indian cultural history. So P.K. Gode was the first curator of Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute and he was a Sanskrit and Prakrit scholar. So deriving mainly from the Sanskrit literary sources, Gode has written five volumes on the cultural history of India, reflecting upon many objects of tangible as well as intangible culture like cosmetics and perfumery, firecrackers, the tambul tradition, that is the tradition of eating pan, and also including rangoli. So in his writings, he has traced many, a few Sanskrit and Prakrit literary sources that mention rangoli. He believed that the history writings of the royal families hardly touch the human beings and that real history should be of society. Now, when I started uh, reading about Rangoli, uh, searching uh, for information and data collection, uh, what I realized was there was very little that was written about Rangoli. You know, scholars like Stella Krembridge, Pupul Jaikar, Ananda Kumaraswamy, and many others, they did mention this art in their uh, works on Indian art, maybe a paragraph or so, you know, talking about women's art, but nothing concrete was there. And what I found were, were these booklets, you know? So the information was scattered all over the country in bits and pieces, but there was no comprehensive write-up on this matter. So obviously I realized that the source of information for me were the women in the villages of our country. And that is when, you know, I started traveling. So the research methodology uh, that I adopted was oral history techniques involving surveys and interviews, field trips to various parts of India for data collection and documentation, interdisciplinary approach deriving from sociology, psychology, anthropology, and ethnology, and examination of the artifacts of history and also of the living present and scholarship to support the revelations from field trips. Now, a little bit about my findings. So let me begin with the most basic thing, the material for making Rangoli. Uh, now, in any folk art, you know, the topography and geography plays a very important role. So uh, the material that is easily available in the surroundings and at the same time has some significance is used by common people. So traditionally in India, the concept of purity is linked with water and cow dung. It is said, Kome Vaste Lakshmi. So Lakshmi resides in the cow dung. And cow dung has antiseptic properties and hence provides a literal threshold of protection for the home. The practice of smearing the house with cow dung is still prevalent in uh, uh, some parts of rural India. It is believed that cow dung, which purifies a place, also renders it unusable and inauspicious unless some decoration is done over it. And I all realized during my travels in rural India that it is this, this dreaded belief that is primarily responsible for the continuation of Rangoli traditions in the villages. In the regions like South India, Bengal and Konkan uh, in Maharashtra where rice is grown, in abundance, rice flour or paste or water left from uh, boiling rice or powder made by burning rice husk is used for making rangoli. Uh, when I asked the ladies, why use edible material when you know non-edible material can easily be used? So they said uh, that rice flour serves as a means of bhuta daya or bhuta yagnya which means offering food to lesser beings like insects and birds as one's good deed of the day. Yeah, so that is the, you know, significance of using this edible material. And uh, in other regions like Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, white pods or lime, uh, lime powder, and sometimes flour of wheat and jawar was is used for making rangoli now lime powder is also a 
kind of uh, disinfected. Yeah. So in Rajasthan, particularly, they use khadiya, what you see here, and this geru like red substance called hirmach. Uh, cow dung is also used in uh, some other uh, rangolis where they are placed on the rangoli, on top of the rangoli. So, for example, this Sankranti Mugu, Mugu is the rangoli from uh, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, you see cow dungs are placed in the center throughout the Sans Sankranti period. And later on, on drying, these uh, cow balls are used as fuel. Now, in Kerala, uh, during Onam, they make uh, this Onam Puvidal or Poo Kolam, as they call it, with fresh flowers. Now, Onam falls uh, around rainy season, so they don't use uh, flour or uh, powder of any kind, but instead they use fresh flowers that are easily available. Uh, the Jain ladies, you know, they make uh, these kind of auspicious symbols in the Jain temples almost every day. It's a daily ritual. It's called Gauli. And the symbols that they make are either swastik or nandyavart and so on. And they use whole rice grain for this purpose. Now, rice grain does not sprout and is therefore used by the Jain ladies to make uh, rangolis. And one more uh, type of rangoli, it is either called the mandala or the kalam, which is made in the temple traditions almost all over India. Uh, these are made by the priests and not the uh, ladies. But uh, what I uh, found was the colors that they use for these uh, uh, ritualistic rangolis are uh, handmade, they're natural colors. And mostly the five colors are used. And these colors are also the found in the you know, literary sources with reference to Rangoli. It always says that Pancha Churnam or Pancha Varna or Dash Artha Varna uh, are used. So what are these five colors? You have white, which can be easily obtained by rice flour or lime powder. You have yellow obtained from turmeric. You have red, which is a combination of limestone and turmeric. Uh, with the because of the chemical reaction, you get red color, green, which is dried and powdered leaves, and sometimes they use blue, which is uh, acquired from indigo, and very rarely uh, they'll use black, which is acquired from charcoal. Now, black is generally considered to be an inauspicious color, but they use it for some uh, you know tantric kind of diagrams or to show the. Ugra avatar or the fearful avatar of the goddesses like Rakteshwari and Bhubaneshwari. Uh, so that is when they use black color. And uh, since I'm talking about temple traditions, uh, let me talk about this very interesting uh, temple rangoli called the Sanji. Now this is made in the Vaishnav Havelis, that is the Krishna temple. And uh, we find it all over India, but mainly in Vrindavan. Uh, now, these rangolis are made, uh, traditionally they used natural colors, but today, of course, they use synthetic colors and it's very colorful. And it's a very intricate process. For each color, they have one stencil. It's like a printing process. So they use hundreds of stencil to make one sanji. And this is how the stencil cutting is done. So in earlier days, you know, they used banana leaf to make the stencil. But today, of course, they use uh, plastic. Now, very broadly, what are the types of rangolis that we see in our country? So the first is, of course, the dotted grid, wherein the dots are connected to each other. And then you uh, form shapes and fill in the shapes with uh, colors. The second type is again a dotted grid, but in this case, the dots are not connected, but the lines circumvent around the dots and the designs are created. This uh, style we see particularly in the uh, southern part of India, mainly in Tamil Nadu. And rest of India, you'll find the free style, uh, you know, uh, without the dots. Yeah. Now, uh, invariably, people, whenever they come to know that I've done research on Rangoli art, the first question is, what is the origin of this art? It's very, very difficult to answer this because this is an ephemeral art. So we have to look for indirect evidences to find its antiquity. 
Now, one of the sources is the cave paintings of prehistoric man. Uh, these paintings are full of symbols, as you see on the top left. And many of these symbols are even today used in Rangoli. You have the dot, the asterisk, uh, the spirals, and the zigzag lines, and circles, and so on and so forth. Uh, it is very likely that making of sand drawings or rangolis preceded the cave paintings. The making of cave paintings requires, you know, some technology or to make a paste and some efforts, yeah. Whereas uh, sand drawings could be made very easily just by running your finger through the sand, clay or mud. So I firmly believe that rangoli is the basic visual art of mankind and it definitely preceded other arts, including uh, cave paintings. This is one interesting uh, Mandana motif. This is Rangoli of Rajasthan, and this is from a cave painting in Rajasthan. This is not prehistoric, but as per the expert, it is from the historic period, uh, but definitely a millennium old. Another source of indirect uh, evidence is the remains of Indus Valley civilization, which is the earliest material evidences uh, found in the Indian subcontinent. And here you clearly see we have found a lot of seals and the symbols on the seal, the crosses are used in Rangoli even today. And of course, the auspicious swastik, a very, very common uh, motif in Rangoli. Uh, Another interesting seal that is found is having a woman issuing a plant. And, uh, you know, in Rajasthan, I found, came across this mandana where uh, the same concept is shown symbolically. You know, the, this triangle basically uh, resembles the generative, uh, it is a symbol for the generative female organ. And you see it is issuing a plant. And this is a very, uh, uh, you know, Symbol of fertility, basically, and it is drawn by women desiring to have children. Yeah. And here you have uh, the snake on the seal, and snake is a very, very popular motif in Rangoli all over India, but particularly in uh, Kerala and southern part of India and in the Konkan region of Maharashtra. Yeah. Then you have uh, motif. This is exactly like the column of South India, the loop motif. And you have toys having the chakra view or the maze, uh, the labyrinth. And again, the chakra view is a very, very popular Rangoli motif. Another source of information has to be the Adivasis or the tribals of our country. Now, the lifestyle of the tribals remains majorly unchanged. Uh, and so it provides a window to peep into the past. These tribal societies, because of their isolation, have retained their ancient ways of life up to a great uh, extent. And, you know, we commonly know about their wall paintings, like the Warlis and all, but they have a very strong tradition of making rangolis as well. So they make the chalks uh, during weddings, and they also make... Uh, Rangoli diagrams for funerary rites. So they would just make some circles and place the body of the deceased, deceased on it. Those circles are called bhaura, and it has its own uh, significance as per their beliefs. Now we come to direct evidence, which is the literary sources. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, P.K. Gode had, uh, you know, listed down some sources from Sanskrit uh, literature, Sanskrit and pra Prakrit literature, but uh, I found a few more. And of course, chronologically, I've gone much behind beyond uh, uh, his period. So the first uh, source mentioning the term Rangavali was, uh, I found it in the Pauma Charyu, which is the Jain version of Ramayana. Okay, and roughly the period is first to third century AD. Now, I'm not going through all these sources because there are many, but I'll just highlight a few. Uh, like the Kama Sutra by Vatsayana, it mentions 64 hours. There are many other literary sources, but these literary sources also that mention the uh, 64 arts that is to be practiced by man of culture, as they say. And in this list, the sixth art is type of Rangoli, says uh, 
tandula kusuma vali so which means uh, diagrams made out of rice and flour and uh, so we come to know the significance of this art in ancient times and then there are various other sources uh, there's shilpa ratnam uh, by uh, sri kumar from kerala where he talks about dhuli chitra and rasa chitra so dhuli chitra is powder diagrams and uh, rasa chitra is diagrams made out of paste yeah and then sorry uh i come to the period closer to us now this is a, a very interesting book uh by a french uh, scholar and he writes about hindu manners and uh, customs and ceremonies particularly in tamil nadu and in this he what i found interesting is uh, he writes about a person a man who has died and his wife is lamenting his death and she says that i you know ran the household so sincerely i looked after the children i cooked i did this and that and i made columns every day but still why did you leave me so you know this shows the significance of art in their lives in that point of time so and parsis of course their rangolis are very well uh, documented or written about in their literary works i'll talk more about it later the oldest booklet of rangoli that i have come across so far and i believe probably it is the oldest uh, was printed in mumbai and it is this uh, booklet rangavali ka by godavari by panditin uh, the date of publishing is uh, 1867 and in this this lady writes a preface saying that uh, kulin striya it's in marathi kulin striya so women of culture you know they have to make rangolis every day and nowadays they are so busy so you know it's a task to get up in the morning and think what to draw today so that so convenience reason i'm giving 30 diagrams in my book so women don't have to think much they can just look at the diagram and draw it and uh, that's how you know she's uh, included those 30 diagrams and but she just writes the names the titles of the designs without explaining the significance uh then there are various notes this particular uh, literary work is my favorite it's a poetry on uh, rangoli it's titled rangoli rangoli ghalta na pahun by keshav sut again i'll talk more about it later now i want to highlight just two uh, literary sources because uh these two inspired outsiders like uh you know who were looking at this art from outsiders perspective and they were so inspired that one of them wrote a paper about it and the other one actually came out with a book on it yeah so the first one you know there was this gentleman b a gupte who had written an article on diwali folklore in the indian antiquary 1902 in which he included this diagram of diwali rangoli made by his wife and this diagram uh, George so George Borgwood and uh, Sir Richard Temple both of them happened to see this diagram and they praised it and uh, you know the uh, in his letter uh, to B A Gupte Sir George Wood uh, writes um, you can hardly know how interesting Mrs Gupte's drawing is in connection with current theories of the evolution and devolution of ornament your paper is invaluable he further says uh, as i am under a promise to write something for the society of art general, journal on conventionalism in primitive art mrs gupte's drawing will greatly help me in this yeah and in this paper he actually writes this this mode of and uh, yeah he reproduces the uh, diwali rangoli so he says this mode of decoration in india is entirely a domestic art hereditary in hindu families on the female side only and the designs used are of a dateless tradition the study of this ritualistic design devices seems to me to suggest at least two obvious conclusions the desire of the moth for the star of the night for the morrow the devotion to something afar from the sphere of our soul yeah and the second source that i would like to point out is uh, 
uh, you know, the principle of uh, Sir J.J. School of Art in the 1920s was uh, Mr. W.E. Gladstone Solomon. And at that time, uh, Rao Bhadu Dhurandar, uh, who belonged to the Pathare Prabhu community, he was a professor in J.J. School of Art and they both were very uh, good friends. And uh, Gladstone Solomon used to go to the Pathare Prabhu colonies along with uh, Rao Bhadu Dhurandar. And, uh, you know, he was uh, so inspired by the rangolis made by the Pathari Prabhu women that he eventually wrote a book, Charm of Indian Art, in which he actually documents the rituals and the um, associated art uh, of the Pathari Prabhu women. And just to quote one paragraph uh, uh, from his book, every morning the design of the night before is removed with cow dung and water and the surface prepared for the fresh drawing of the afternoon. Wonderful, wasteful Indian art. Yet, who shall say that these pictures, although more evanescent than the flower-like beauty of the artists, are altogether lost? Yeah. And uh, what are the diagrams that he probably saw, the rangolis that he saw? So, uh, uh, you know, Pathare Prabhu community, uh, they make rangolis for uh, very religiously for the eight days uh, starting before Diwali up till the last day, the Bhaubi's day. And uh, every day they make specific rangoli over the years. You know, the design is fixed on, for that particular day. And these lovely sketches uh, were provided to me by none other than, uh, you know, who else but uh, Advocate Rajan Jaikar. And he, uh, you know, these sketches are handmade by an elderly lady who had maintained this diary of uh, Pathari Prabhu sketches. Yeah. And another interesting rangoli made by these ladies. Uh, we know the King George V and his wife, Queen Mary, visited India for the Delhi Darbar and uh, went via uh, Mumbai in 1911 and on their, their return journey was also from Mumbai. So they were given a very uh, warm welcome and also a very warm farewell. And uh, at the time of uh, the farewell, you know, they had this big exhibitions depicting Indian art and the Pathari Prabhu women were very active, uh, you know, in uh, ha having those displays. And uh, one of the attraction of the exhibition was the uh, rangoli stall and here you see this rangoli made by the Prabhu ladies in fact the names are also known Kumari Manat by Janardhan Kothare uh, and her sister and they uh, made this you know the ladies are doing RP for the royal couple so very very interesting rangoli now, let me come to symbolism. Now, Rangoli art is a storehouse of symbols, beginning with the auspicious dot or the bindu. The symbols of Rangoli go on expanding to form a line and basic geometric shapes like the circle, triangle, square, spirals, and so on, each having its own symbolic value in representing the basic energies of the universe. They can be combined in increasing complex figures to represent particular forces or qualities embodied in some specific aspect of creation, evolution, dissolution. Uh, you know, the con consistent preoccupation. Now, what I found when I uh, saw these uh, Rangoli diagrams, the underlying significance has to do, uh, you know, something with either fertility, death, rebirth, birth, you know. Uh, so, uh, we, let me start with the Bindu. Now, Bindu is the very basic uh, symbol. It is the uh, genesis or the point of origin and end, all beginnings and all dissolutions. The Bindu in itself is considered a yantra, which represents the center of the universe. And when the Bindu expands, it, form, it forms the line. Line is, signifies development and growth, movement and progression. Now, when the lines intersect, they form shapes. So here you have two lines intersecting, eventually forming a swastik. Swastik is the most auspicious symbol in Rangoli that I found. And not only in India, you know, swastik is a very auspicious symbol 
across cultures. We find it in Mesopotamian culture, Egyptian culture. Uh, all the cultures have their own uh, symbolic meaning for the swastik. Even in India, different religions, uh, you know, uh, attach different significance to the symbol. Like, for example, in Hinduism, it is dharma, artha, kama, moksha. The four sides of uh, swastik uh, represent that. Whereas the Jains consider it to be the four uh, katis or the states of existence uh, that the soul may be born into before gaining uh, moksha. And the Buddhists uh, consider it a very auspicious symbol because it is believed that it was uh, present on the palm of Buddha, so, so on and so forth. Then when the lines, three lines intersect, they form again a very potent symbol of fertility. Now this symbol we find in uh, uh, Germanic alphabets, the runes, where it is a symbol of protection and fertility. And you see this symbol, the interlocking of two triangles. Again, this represents the union of Purush and Prakriti. So the upward pointing triangle is the Purush or the male uh, aspects of creation. The downward pointing is Prakriti or the female aspects and their union results in creation. And this symbol is used across cultures. We know this as Star of David, right? but uh, very, very much uh, used in Rangolis. And then the intersection of four lines. Again, in cuneiform script, this represents God. Uh, the symbolic meaning of this is, uh, you know, the, it is like guardian of uh, different directions, yeah? And uh, this symbol then forms into various forms like the octagon or you can have the ashtadal padma or the lotus and flowers and all that very auspicious symbol in uh, rangoli and then you have various rangolis uh, where you know for example this yantra this is very much similar to the uh, weaves used in textile it actually represents the honeycomb weave yeah and here you have the vastu purush mandal which is uh, Rangoli actually drawn by priests when they uh, lay the foundation for any building, you know, when they do the Vastu Puja. So depicting all the directions. And this particular one I found very interesting. This is called Vishnuchi Rangoli in uh, Maharashtra, but it is used all over India. Now the term Vishnu, Vish is Vishwa, Anu is atom. So, you know, uh, all pervading kind of uh, symbolism and this structure of atom uh, which I read were emerged or was discovered in 1800s but this Rangoli called Vishnu has existed for uh, you know since antiquity now I don't know I mean what is the connection here but I read a lot and there are various other symbols like you know the component found in hemoglobin and chlorophyll, which is very commonly used in Rangoli, it has uh, six uh, sides and so on and so forth. Uh, I have mentioned all this in my book. So uh, this is something very interesting. And uh, uh, what I read about is, uh, I'll just uh, read it. Physicist Fritz of Capra in his book, The Tao of Physics writes, Eastern thought and more generally mystical thought provide a consistent and relevant philosophical background to the theories of contemporary science, a conception of the world in which scientific discoveries can be in perfect harmony with spiritual aims and religious beliefs. So I think this uh, very uh, correctly, you know, explains uh, what is the principle behind this. I mean, how do you find such scientific symbols in our uh, folk art? Uh, few Rangoli show some affinity to architectural structures. So you have the Pushkarni, the Baudi uh, that is commonly drawn across India and uh, it resembles the step well, you know. And this particular uh, Rangoli, which we commonly see in Maharashtra, and I always thought, what are these uh, symbols? Is it just, uh, you know, some aesthetic uh, figure or it has some meaning? And in that old book that I referred to, 
by Kodavari Bai. She refers to this a similar diagram as Tulsi Se Vrindavan. And then I realized that this is the top view of the Tulsi Se Vrindavan or the place where, you know, the Tulsi plant is grown, the Chabutra as they call it. Yeah. And here we have the Sarvato Bhadra Mandal, a very uh, common architectural plan used in ancient times, particularly for temples. So Sarvatra Bhadra is auspicious from all sides and it's a common yantra uh, made in Rangolis. Then there are a lot of animal motifs that I used. All these motifs are either symbol of fertility or wisdom like the owl or longevity like the tortoise and all these, the word butterfly called Prajapati is a, a popular symbol of fertility in Bengal. When you have animals in pairs, again, uh, symbol of creation and fertility. But there are some animals that are revered out of fear. So for example, you have the tiger's foot, yeah, which is drawn in Rangoli and you have the actual figure of tiger. This one is made by the uh, ladies belonging to the Meena tribes of Rajasthan. And the Meena tribes live very close to Rantambore and you know, probably come very close to wildlife. So that is the reason they uh, draw tigers in their Rangoli. And of course, you have the cow's uh, footprints uh, drawn as uh, to acknowledge the unconditional service of the cow to humanity. So footprints of cow, again, very popular motif all over India. And the footprint of the goddess Lakshmi. Also, you have footprints of uh, baby Krishna drawn during Gopalashtami. Now, Lakshmi as a goddess emerges for the first time in the Sri Sukta, which is a part of the Rigveda. It, 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 it is a part of the 10th mandal of Rigveda. The 10th part of the Rigveda has the Sri Sukta. And Lakshmi doesn't come alone. Yeah, she is the goddess of wealth, prosperity, abundance, but she doesn't arrive alone. You know, there's another goddess who's the goddess of misfortune and poverty called as a Lakshmi. Yeah. So as per the Hindu uh, beliefs, the first thing you have to do is drive away a Lakshmi to welcome Lakshmi. So that is what we do practically. Like during Diwali, we clean the house and remove all the dirt and dust and old things and all that. And then wait for Lakshmi to arrive. Right. And that is what is drawn in Rangoli. Uh, I found this symbolism drawn a lot in North India. Yeah. So here they're driving away a Lakshmi. So the footprints are facing outwards and welcoming Lakshmi. Yeah. And then Rangoli has magic diagrams. Now these diagrams read the name Bengan Ka Binta, Nimbu Ki Dali, or uh, Singade Ka Chok. Now, I didn't know what these diagrams are and why these plants are used here. Thankfully, the title was there, so you could I could make some sense out of it. But when I asked the ladies, why do you make these? So they were like, nee, shub, shub shakun hai, and all these answers, but nobody could give me a proper answer. Then I read a lot, you know, uh, tried to understand the symbology behind this. And... I realized that all these are thorny plants. Yeah. Singada, I never knew had thorns because what we get in the market is the black or the green singada and they remove the thorns before selling it. So when I first saw singada with the thorn, it just clicked me out. What is the commonality between these uh, uh, designs? So Bengan ka binta, that stem of the Bengan has thorn, the uh, Nimbuki dali has thorn. Yeah and uh, the singada now these diagrams are made during uh, weddings or when the new bride comes to the house or for the uh, threading ceremony so you know extra protection is required during these ceremonies and that's why to drive away the evil uh, thorny diagrams are drawn so this actually looks very appealing aesthetically but these are all thorns yeah you see the thorn here and here also yeah. And thorny or prickly plants are uh, considered as useful guardians against evil in many other cultures across the world. 
Uh, in fact, the native protector of Scotland is the thistle plant, which is nothing but a thorny plant. And then Rangoli has picture writing. So, you know, many Rangoli diagrams uh, are hieroglyphic in nature. Yeah. You see, uh, uh, these can be traced to pictorial uh, representations of ancient times. So probably Rangoli in earlier days must have been a sort of picture writing and must have preceded the development of actual written script. Uh, you know, very interestingly, Rangolis are referred to as Likmu in uh, Himachal Pradesh. Also in old literary sources like the poetry by Keshav, Kavi Keshav Suth, he says Lihine. And in uh, Rajasthan, the ladies always say ki, in Manna. So they ask each other that what have you drawn? But they never use the term drawn. It is always Likna. So, uh, you know, uh, there are also references to column designs uh, where uh, they say that simple column motifs drawn uh, were drawn on the threshold in olden days, which were indicators of the member of the respective family suffering from disease like smallpox. So um, when I talked to the ladies, they all knew that such diagrams did exist, but they didn't know exactly what was drawn. So probably these diagrams are lost to us. But, uh, you know, looking at those columns, people would know that you should, you're not supposed to enter the house because somebody is not well. So, you know, here we clearly see that Rangoli was used as a means of communication. Also in Kautilya's Arthashastra, there's a chapter on espionage where he says that ganikas or uh, courtesans who are highly trained, trained in different arts, uh, you know, acted as spies. So they went and lived in the enemy houses and used Sanketik Bhasha or sign language to pass on messages. So probably Rangoli is one of the, uh, you know, uh, source of passing on secret messages. So it's definitely a means of communication. And yeah, in Bengal, you have the uh, Vrata Alpana. Vrata is wow. So whenever these girls and ladies used to do Vratas, uh, they used to draw Alpana. And these drawings all were always accompanied by some spells called as Chadas. So if they, uh, the lady would draw the necklace, she would sing a song saying that, please give me this golden necklace or give me a hand and some husband and uh, jewelry and saris and so on and so forth. But there were also alpanas that actually cursed uh, people, you know. So it was believed that whatever you draw accompanied by what you say, uh, that whole combination will bring the things alive, yeah. So as you draw the things that you desire, you also draw things that you do not desire. So for example, there were curses for co-wives. Yeah, so for, uh, for example, the lady would draw a knife and say, uh, knife, cut the vegetables for the funeral of the co-wife. And I shall, I shall put alta or the red mark on my feet by the blood of co-wife and so on and so forth. So kind of black magic was actually practiced. Of course, ladies do not draw these kind of alpanas nowadays. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, so in the recent past, uh, artists like Nandalal Bose and his students have come up with a new type of alpana, which is very ornamental and decorative. It's called the Shanti Niketan Alpana. So today on regular basis, you find these ornamental alpanas and if at all the vows and all are uh, followed, uh, they do make uh, Ratha Alpana, but definitely not the negative ones. And Rangoli has close connection with mathematics. So for example, you find tessellation or tiling in Rangoli. So tessellation is a branch of mathematics that studies how shapes known as tiles can be arranged to fill a plane uh, without any gaps or overlaps. Yeah? And also the grid of uh, Rangoli are a good source of, uh, you know, uh, drawing different diagrams uh, using permutation and combination. So I wish, you know, the, uh, this is how mathematics is taught to children in school. And then the geometric concept of golden spiral, which you see in nature, 
uh, is the sunflower and the same concept is used in uh, rangoli as well. And then you have fractals. So fractals are basically what you see in the cauliflower or the fern leaves where the one part resembles the whole. So here, uh, actually I spoke to a few mathematicians and one, uh, I would like to mention one particular gentleman, Dr. Vivek Patko, who's written a book on mathematics and art. And there, uh, you know, he mentioned about fractals in Rangoli and uh, the fractal antenna of cells. If you see the diagrams are absolutely similar. Yeah. And then there are computer scientists from India and abroad who have studied the Rangoli designs done by uh, village women, particularly in South India, uh, the women who made poems and they develop they have developed picture languages so which helps in image processing and computer vision uh, of course this is not my subject but their papers are available online so if anybody wants to uh, read more about it uh, you can find their papers uh, now when i came about uh, came across this information i started reading more about uh, this concept of you know uh, computer scientists studying poem diagrams. And I came across some interviews of computer scientists, mainly from uh, Southern part of India, who said that their first introduction to maths, mathematics was through poems, yeah, uh, which were made by, uh, at home by the women in their houses. So again, I feel, you know, the incorporation of this traditional art in the school curriculum may um, contribute towards a more productive and creative uh, mathematics education and fun way of learning. Now, just to highlight uh, Rangolis of few communities besides the Hindus. So the Jains have a very uh, old tradition of making Rangolis. So in the temples, they have uh, yantras, you know, uh, so dedicated to different uh, jinnas or uh, the Siddha Chakra Yantra, and sometimes they are made by priests or uh, sometimes by uh, ladies. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, the Gauli, which is made by females in the Jain temples. Then there's the Pasi Chok. So as as I mentioned earlier, even Pasis have a very old tradition of making chalks. Now. Uh, I don't know exactly whether it is derived from, uh, you know, influenced by the Gujarati Rangolis because, you know, they got completely assimilated into Gujarati culture. But uh, whatever may be the origin, one thing is sure that they used their own unique motives or even today they use their own unique motives. For example, this is the Sase, that is the Arti Thali of uh, Rangoli. Uh, sorry, Ar Arti Thali called says, which they make in the, uh, their rangoli and they call their rangoli chalk. So chalk, again, I feel it is the chowk or the chowk, you know, which is drawn uh, in rangoli. But some Basi ladies told me that it is the material that they use, the chalk powder. Yeah. So, and then the uh, horseshoe and then you have the holy fire and all of that. Yeah. And this is a beautiful old uh, picture uh, of ladies making rangoli in Gujarat. And then the Buddhist mandala. Now, Buddhist mandalas are drawn for healing and meditation purpose and also as a part of the process of initiation. So the young lamas actually begin by drawing an outline uh, of the mandala followed by days and months of painstaking process of laying off the colored sands. The sand is poured from traditional metal funnels called chakur, which you see here in the picture. And uh, each monk holds a chakur in one hand while running a metal rod on its serrated surface. The vibration causes the sand to flow like liquid. So the intricate construction process takes several months. Now on the final day when the mandala is ready, the chief lama or the teacher uh, comes to the room and observes the mandala and in one swipe of his robe, you know, 
he just wipes out the design. Now the student's response to this action decides if he is ready for the initiation or not, if he's ready to become a monk or not. Because if tears flow down from his eyes, it means that he's still attached to the material world and not fit to be a monk. Yeah. So this is done as a teaching tool and it is a metaphor for the impermanence of our existence and everything around us. So this apply also applies to everyday rangolis actually done by the ladies as the value of rangolis lies solely in its creation and it is never meant to last. Now, in any research, it becomes necessary to do comparative uh, study for holistic understanding of the subject. So when I began reading about floor art in other parts of the world, uh, there were many surprises in store for me. So, uh, for example, this particular diagram, you see it is so similar to the poem in, uh, made in southern part of India. And this is actually drawn by the Chokwe tribe in uh, southern Africa. Yeah, and these are called Angolan, uh, Angola, Angolan Sona drawings. Yeah, so the term for these diagrams is Sona. Now, uh, uh, these diagrams are used as part of storytelling, making reference to pro proverbs, fables, games, riddles, thus transmitting knowledge and wisdom from one generation to the next. Uh, there's this Dutch uh, ethnomathematician, Dr. Paulus Curtis, who has done extensive research on the sonar diagrams, and he used them in classrooms as a learning aid for the development of new mathematical ideas and methods. Yeah. So I wish the same for uh, in our classrooms also. Uh, these are a few other uh, floor arts. So this is by the Native American tribes, particularly the Navajo tribes who make sand paintings uh, as a part of healing process. Uh, these are the waves by the Haitian voodoo practitioners of Caribbean islands. These are done by the tribes living on the Vanuatu Islands in the Caribbean Sea, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, sorry. And these are done by the Australian Aborigines. Yeah. And uh, these are all, they are often accompanied by storytelling and uh, are used by parents, particularly mothers, to disseminate knowledge and teach cultural values to their children. Now, the Vanuatu sand drawings are the only type of floor arts which have been recognized by UNESCO as masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. Yeah. But what came as a big surprise to me was the rangolis that were made in Europe. I had never expected uh, to find this kind of reference. Uh, in fact, when I first time uh, read about it, I was so curious that I actually went to Scotland and uh, sat in the National Archives and other libraries to you know, find out more information about it. And if you see the date here, this is made uh, in 1908 in Scotland. And the last documentation of the Rangoli art there is from 1920s. So just 100 years back, we had this tradition of making Rangoli. Today, of course, it's uh, no more practice there. And a uh, few more pictures that I found. So this is a Scottish lady. You see the Rangoli on the threshold. And this lady is from Slovenia. And you see like, she's standing on this big uh, decoration of Rangoli. And then I got many motifs uh, that they drew. Again, the same similarity in motifs. Yeah, you see this Rangoli, which is made everywhere in India. This, in fact, is the Raksha Yantra made by Mithila women in India. You have the Ashtadal and the prickly uh, motifs. So this is Thisal, the native protector of uh, Scotland or the national emblem. Yeah. And uh, I also went through their folklore and sayings and one couplet particularly uh, was very interesting. It says, tangled thread and roven seed guard the witches, lose their speed. So 
it means that when you draw such complicated diagrams it will uh, uh, you know the witches will lose their speed which means it will keep the evil away so, so same purpose same concept and uh, similarity in backups so i feel there are seem to be two possibilities with respect to the practice of floor art in different parts of the world and the similarities that they share one is that different people invented the same mnemonic device in response to the same needs of facilitating the transmission of ideas and values from one generation to the next and also for protection from evil uh, so like how we have uh, cave paintings all over the world so it's there in lascaux in france or altamira in spain or himbetka in india and various other places so same principle applies here and uh, another possibility is that the art of drawing symbols on the floor passed on from one region to another owing to the migration of mankind so the continuity of similar patterns being drawn through africa to scotland and to india indicates some exchange of ideas possibly through the migration of people from one place to another and then coming to one more type of rangoli which people call it as rangoli but it's not the conventional or traditional form of rangoli it's more of fine art uh created using the medium of rangoli so just like you would paint with the uh, oil paints on canvas you make uh, these kind of compositions using the medium of rangoli of course this requires very high skill but then there's no uh, symbolism or meaning attached to it yeah and then you have uh, like the sanskar bharti a new trend which has come about some two decades back where huge rangolis are made publicly and then many artists experiment like uh, nowadays you have 3d rangolis with sound and light light effect uh, which are meant to be seen with uh, anaglyph glasses and many devices are there in the market these of course are old ones the thasse or the stamps or the rangoi uh, which was used for uh, creating rangolis around meal plates yeah the stickers and every other new devices that come to the market and how can we forget the indians who have settled abroad and who have carried the indian traditions with them including the tradition of uh, making rangolis yeah now uh, as modernization is seeping into our culture we are slowly losing touch with our traditional customs and rituals so it has indeed become difficult to follow the traditional routine uh, regularly due to lack of time space or interest and uh, with this fast pace of life that we are adapting to maintaining religious standards is also becoming difficult so uh, the cement concrete flats you know to nowadays hardly offer any scope for the collective creativity of earlier days uh but nevertheless it appears that uh, the tradition of making rangoli has surpassed the test of time the art art is constantly evolving and today has blossomed into a delightful visual art with secular aesthetic appeal it is seen that one moment uh, does not obliterate or overtake or destroy destroy another preceding it only a further layer is added so these changes are inevitable and are bound to occur so in my capacity uh, you know i have been collecting uh, rangoli diagrams from the time i started my research and probably i have the largest collection i'm not sure so i eventually plan to uh, digitize all the designs that i have so that those can be used by uh, symbologist the uh, artists and uh, designer yeah so this is just one example which i have included in my book uh, i've given few more where rangoli designs can be uh, applied to various other fields yeah so with this i end my presentation now just the last part i always love to end my presentations with this uh, small uh, paragraph the last para of the poetry by kavi keshav sooth which i have mentioned earlier so uh, those who do not understand marathi a uh, very uh, quick uh, simple translation that do not turn a blind eye to this 
mundane or uh, you know uh, daily art of uh, rangoli because if you observe it properly you will realize that this is where heaven appears on earth yeah so that is what he's trying to say and these lines were are the ones that actually inspired me and uh, helped me sustain through my research journey so i was traveling all over india for 5 years yeah and uh, if you have any information any old pictures uh, books or anything that you would like to share with me i can always scan and give it back to you so feel free to write to me about it yeah thank you so much for your patient listening thank you nena that was uh, really interesting um, a lot of comments coming in people have been very appreciative of the talk uh, vinita shridharani in fact said what i felt too that she's amazed at the co-linking across cultures a uh, very insightful talk she says thanks to kaki and dr nena um and yeah i mean i found very interesting that there are so many cultural connects between you know whether it's vanuatu or slovenia or scotland mongolia so it's yeah. quite fascinating uh kirti savan says excellent talk madam thank you uh, vaibhavi oak says she found it very interesting to discover that parsis also have angoli uh mm -hmm. amita too says interesting uh vibha simha references puli kolam and the creative mind uh, a book for kids learning mathematics and rangoli she says yeah uh commander mohan narayanan says uh, this talk was an eye opener never imagine the ubiquitous kolam and uh, puva kolam during onam held so many hidden secrets uh priti made an interesting observation that the pathare prabhus also have a very unique style of underwater slash overwater rangolis yeah yeah Um, so you know there are many things uh, all these things are there in my book but uh, since we have limited time i couldn't include everything yeah sure um so ram uh, warrior had two questions the first one was uh, i think you kind of touched upon this actually can the etching symbols and stories in the bhimbetka cave shelters near bhopal also kind of construe to have their origins in rangoli art yes according to me definitely because rangoli art uh, must have 100% like i would say preceded the cave paintings because as i mentioned it's very easier to draw something on the floor but painting something on the wall you require some effort some uh, technology to make the colors and uh, add some binding to it so that it sticks to the wall and all that yeah so that must have definitely not been the primary art uh his other question is uh, also interesting is rangoli art only what happens on the floor for example can wagli art which has largely happens on wall surfaces also be categorized as a form of rangoli no so no so we don't call that rangoli we just call it wall paintings rangoli is basically floor art right a um, couple of other observations and comments have come in uh Shilpa says uh, excellent talk and wonderful information about the cultural types of rangoli dynamic naina Ramesh Naidu says ma'am thank you for an informative session um same ambadas deshmukh thank you so much ma'am wonderful talk amit talk again interesting topic different um namita excellent session informative thank you <clears throat> uh namita says rangoli equal to bhu alankaram yeah decoration of the floor yeah yeah so lots of lots of appreciative comments uh, naina this has been very interesting amit just posted saying didn't know that rangoli art has such a long history and so much interconnection among various cultures amazing research and and talk to thank you uh maybe i can ask a question actually i had which is uh has the tradition of rangoli uh, the patterns the colors uh, largely remained the same over time have they evolved and uh has it evolved is there been any impact on the use of technology like stencils and digital design tools uh, yeah, and does definitely. that still qualify as rangoli uh yeah i mean we call it rangoli only but yeah this impact is very much visible in urban areas Yeah, today we ladies don't have time, and they quickly use stamp out the rangoli instead of drawing it and stencils and all that. But in rural India, up to a large extent, the art still uh, survives in its traditional or I would say purer form. 
uh, where they actually draw the rangotis. Uh, Vaibhavi has just asked a question saying, is Rangoli used anywhere slash any culture to depict grief? Generally, it's related to happiness. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, again, I've written about this in my book. So there are Rangolis made during uh, funerary rites. So I talked about the Wadlis, you know, the tribes, but also in other cultures, uh, there are Rangolis made on the 10th day of, uh, you know, after the death in the death uh, funerary rituals and these rangolis are drawn by left hand by the priest yeah not by the right hand and there are like somewhere i read that the swastik if it is to be drawn it's drawn ulta you know these kind of uh, symbols are used but it is used during at the time of grief as well yes can you share the name of your book again uh it's uh rangoli kalatmak saundaryacha ved so if you can Google it, it's, I think it's available on bookganga.com. Actually, I recently, somebody told me it's out of print and uh, very soon we are going with the second edition. Actually. Okay. Yeah, my publisher is very keen on that. Yeah. <laughs> so Amit asks, uh, how exactly and what interested you to explore this topic? A very simple answer would be because nobody had explored it before me. <laughs> so I realized, you know, the dearth of uh, research on this topic. So obviously you like to research something which is unexplored and not written about. Thank you so much, Naina, for that wonderful talk. My and thanks everyone else uh, for dialing in and we'll see you guys hopefully next week. Bye and have a nice weekend.